Hey my friends, this is Daniel Alley, and you know who I am, but today I have a very special guest named Victor Antonio. Now Victor is a sales superstar. He's a boss's boss's boss. He's written 13 books, he's traveled the world, and he's reached millions of people. Victor, good to have you. Thank you for having me, Daniel. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. So today we're going to talk about sales because sales is the highest paying profession. Why should someone get into sales? See, I mean, not everybody should be in sales. You got to want to be in sales. Right. But, I, but one of the reasons I love that profession is that, you know, what other profession can you control your financial destiny, right. how much money you make? Yeah. And sales is that profession. It's not just about getting a salary. It's about if you hustle, you get paid more. Right. I don't know. I like that. And it's also one of the oldest professions of all time. So what makes a really great salesperson? I think there's a lot of things that make a great salesperson. And, you know, one of the things I always tell people is that it's not so much about loving the product. Right. You have to love what it does for your customer. Now, that's big, Daniel, because too often people say, well, you know, I, there's nothing I love to sell. Yeah. It has nothing to do with you. Right. It has everything to do with what your customer wants and how you can help them. Right. When you look at businesses, for example, if I'm selling a product to a business, yeah. businesses only care about three things, Daniel. Increase revenue, reduce costs, expand my market share. Right. Can you help me do that with your product or service, Victor? Yes, I say. Yeah. And if I can help them do that, think about this. Think about the social good associated with selling that most people don't think about. If I help a company grow, because yeah. I sell you a product or service, right? Yeah. Your company grows, well, you employ 100 people, of course. right? 100 people have 100 families. Right. So the fact that you're growing, I helped you and your 100 people. Right. But the value exchange here is that I sold you a product. My company made a little profit, right. value for value. Right. Now we employ 100 people, which means we helped 100 families. Right. See, there is a social good in selling that most yeah. people don't see. Right, right. And everything is sold. Everything. I mean, this couch, this hotel. We're in the Ritz-Carlton, by the way, in Atlanta, Georgia. Our suits, everything that you buy, mm -hmm. everything that you see has been sold. Nothing moves without a sale. Right. Now, you've gotten into sales uh, quite a while ago, mm -hmm. and you're originally an engineer. How do you make that transition? What got you into sales? So I started out as an engineer. So I tell the story that when I got into engineering, I did it for the money. Like right. most of us, you know, we do it for the money. So my family's originally from Puerto Rico. And so when they moved to the U.S. in the late 50s, we were poor. We lived near the, um, the inner city of Chicago, near the Cabrini Green Housing Projects, Humble Park area. Right. And so we were poor, 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 poor. <laughs> you know, food stamps, government cheese, powdered milk. Right. Mother said, go to college. I'll give you the short version here, Daniel. Yeah. She said, go to college. And then I said, what makes a lot of money? engineer, so I became an electrical engineer. Right. Three years into the gig, I hate it. <laughs> and I'm sure people who are watching this can relate. They do something for the money, they get into it, they make a little money, the money lasts for a while. Right. It's like a little placebo, it feels good, yes. but then after a while, the reality of what you're doing, is that I don't like this. Yeah. And so there was something here, and I'll call it a, a, a quiet discontent. Yeah. And the quiet discontent is when you know you're not aligned with what you should be doing. Exactly. And so I searched around, I did different things, but when I found sales, it's like, boom, I hit the hyper pad. That was like something that was very natural for me. Right. And at that time, you know, our son was one year old. My wife wanted to stay home and an opportunity opened up for me to be a sales person in Latin America. Uh -huh. And they were looking for somebody who spoke Spanish, had a technical background. And it was like, you know, a confluence of perfection, right? Perfect timing. And then when I got into sales, I had a great mentor and he taught me how to sell right. and I haven't looked back since. Right, and guys, you need a mentor if yep. you wanna learn how to sell. <laughs> I mean, no one can really succeed at the highest level without having someone to guide them and direct them and teach them the basics, the fundamentals, but also the specific skills. Sales, I always tell you guys, if you wanna become a millionaire, if you wanna be wealthy, you need to learn how to sell. Every single person that becomes rich knows how to sell. They sell themselves, they sell their products, they sell their services. So guys, learn how to sell. Victor. Tell me, what happens when a person gets into sales but feels like they may get rejected? Or maybe mm -hmm. they, they go into sales and they think, you know what, it may not be as stable as I want it to be. You know, like they, they tell you, don't get into commissions mm -hmm. because you might make $1,000 a month one time and then 10000 you know, and it's mm -hmm. inconsistent. What do you say about that? Well, first of all, you know, if you want stability and consistency, don't go into sales, right? <laughs> yeah. Because that's why we get paid the big bucks, if I can put it that way. Right. Because we're putting ourselves out there. Rejection is part of the game. We're going to lose deals. You know, if you want a steady salary, then go get a regular job. Yeah. That's a, that simple. If you want a steady salary, get a regular job. But if you want to go on sales and you want to make more money than more, most other people are making, that's where you have to be. But again, because you're risking, that's why you're getting the reward. Right, right. Risk, reward. 
no risk, no reward. If you have a set job, there's no risk there. Right. You got the you know the salary. But sales is about risk and reward. But right. I'm telling you, anybody can learn how to sell. I don't care if you're an introvert or an extrovert. Right. You can learn how to sell. Right, right. And and we're both a little introverted in our own ways. Um, we call it ambivert, right? Because right. we're introverted. We like to be by ourselves, but we also like to be outside. So. <laughs> What do you tell people that are more introverted or mm -hmm. ambiverted? What, what advice would you give them? Well, let's zoom back. So, so a couple of years ago, a guy by the name of Daniel Pink wrote a book called Drive. Yes. And in there, he talked about a study that was done by a guy, I think his name was Adam Grant. Right. And Adam Grant did this study where he studied salespeople. Right. And so group one, let's study on a scale of one to 10, introvert, extrovert. Boom, introverts over here, extroverts over here, and everything in the middle. And when they looked at the sales at the end of the month, so to speak, they saw this distribution curve that it wasn't about being an introvert, they didn't sell the most, right. or the extrovert, it was the ambivert. Somewhere between being an introvert and extrovert, that's where the sweet spot of selling is. Yeah. And why do you think that is? Well, let's think about it. You know, if you're an extrovert, you're always Talk. talking. Yeah. You're not listening. Yeah. And, and a real salesperson knows how to listen for those clues to indicate how to sell them. An introvert doesn't talk much, which means they don't engage the customer enough to pull the information they need to be more effective at selling. Right. So you gotta be able to listen, but also be able to ask those key questions. Right, right, and it's really important to ask the questions because you know, when you ask a question, you get to understand the psychology of the person you're dealing with, whether it's B2B or B2C sales, mm -hmm. whatever kind of sales you're in, you get to understand exactly what the person wants, which allows you to make that decision, help them to understand exactly what they're purchasing and what kind of result they're gonna achieve at the end. Isn't that right, Victor? That's, I mean, you're dead on. I, I, you know, the only thing I would add to that, just more clarification, because everything you said is spot on. You know, this is something I learned a long time ago. I wish I came up with this statement. It wasn't <laughs> mine, so I'm not taking credit for it. And that is, the average salesperson practices what to say. Yeah. The superior salesperson practices what to ask. Right. Now, that's powerful because too often we're taught, practice what you say. No, practice what to ask. Right. Because if we're asking the right questions, we're guiding the conversation right. to what? A conclusion we've already predetermined. Yes. In other words, if I want you to buy from me, all I have to do is ask you specific questions to see if you're the right customer for me. Exactly. See, and I think, what we, let's, get, let's tie it back to rejection. The reason people get rejected many times is because they got the wrong candidate in front of them. Exactly. If you ask the right questions and you have the right candidate, yes. you're more likely to get a yes than a no. Exactly. Yep. And it's the same thing when you face any kind of rejection or any kind of, uh, you know, when people, when people don't know how to make a decision, you can ask them and lead them into the sale. You know, if someone says, I can't afford it, you say, you know, well, Mr. Prospect, what exactly do you think this product is going to do for you? It's going to help you earn more money. You need a website. You know, you need to invest in your business. You need to do these things. When you ask these questions, it puts you in a position to be able to make that sale, right? To close that deal. And you know what I find is that a lot of times people feel icky about making the sale. You know, they feel like they have to take a shower. They feel like if they have to send out a contract or close a deal, that is kind of a dirty thing to do. What would you say about people like that? Well, I think that the people who feel icky about selling do not understand the value of what they're selling. Right. But, and when I say value, let's define it, because everybody says the word value, they toss it around like confetti, right? Yeah. And when you say value, this is what value means to me. Again, I am helping your business grow right. if I'm B2B, yes. business to business. If I'm business to consumer, I'm helping you psychologically, physically, or financially. Right. If my product is doing that for you, then that is value I am providing. I don't feel icky about helping people. Right. So that's how I look at it. And too often I think people associate selling with selling you something you don't want. Right. That's selling. And that's not selling. No. That, that's basically manipulation. If I sell you something you don't want or yeah. don't need, that's not selling. That's manipulation. I'm not about that. Yeah. I'm about, I think you need this. And I know this can help you. But let me explain why. Right. Right. And that's real selling. That's, you know, when I sell you something you don't want, that's me taking a shortcut. You know, that ABC always be closing, right? Ah, you know, that whole thing. Yeah. And I believe that if you have a persuasive argument right. and you can show the value, all I got to do is nudge you. Yeah. I don't even have to push you, man. I exactly. just got to just nudge you. Yeah. And sometimes people already know what they want. You just have to show them. You have to draw that picture in their mind because we think in images. For instance, I say the word elephant. What are you going to think of an elephant, right? So if you take people down the sales process and show them what they're going to get, they're going to buy it. If you show them how good the car is going to be or how valuable life insurance is going to be once they get it, you know, that, that provides them that assurance, that shows them that they're getting something of value. 
Victor, what is the most important thing that you can tell salespeople mm -hmm. when they're starting out? Well, I think you just touched on something I think it's really important. If I, because I, I love what you just said. And that is when you're selling something to somebody, sometimes they don't know what they want. Right. And the real value of a great salesperson is to show you something in a way that you haven't thought about. Exactly. And a you go perspective, right? Yeah, that's yeah. it. I shifted your perspective. I shifted your paradigm. I made you see something you didn't see. Right. I made you think about something you haven't thought about. Exactly. I gave you a piece of insight that says, hmm, I never looked at it that way. Yeah. Tell me more. That is selling. Yeah. When I can do that to somebody because they didn't think about it, you create that situational awareness right. where they go, okay, you're actually helping me zoom out. Right. It's like, you know what they say, when you got this, your hand this close to a painting, you can't see it. Right, right. You got to step back from the painting to see the picture. Yeah. We as salespeople pull people back so they can see the whole painting. Exactly. Yeah. You, take them, you take them on the mountaintop because a lot of times they're running into the trees, but you need to retreat to the, the, the mountaintop in the forest. Yeah. See the whole picture, right? And guys, write that down. Situational awareness. Right. right? Because you're, you're providing a picture. When a, a, a husband and wife is at home, and they're about to come buy a refrigerator or something, they already think, they go through a mental checklist of things that they want, things that they think that they need. But once they meet the salesperson who has more information that they could even think of, then they can be persuaded because that person brings those, uh, those questions and even answers mm -hmm. and provides them a solution. So um, I like the way you tied the marriage yeah. piece in there because you know sometimes, you know, so, so I've been married 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I can't see something. I don't have the situational awareness. Right. And my wife can go, hey, did you look at that? And I go, no, totally <laughs> missed that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, and that, you know, sometimes that's why it's good actually, side note, to walk into a sales situation with a colleague. Right. Because as you're talking, this person can monitor. Or yes. as you're talking, I can monitor. I love that. So that, that, that yin and yang, the playing off each other, and yes. the other person saw something you didn't, you know, like again, selling, like in personal life, like in professional life, two people that can work together well is all right. Yeah, extremely complimentary too. Yep. You want to work with people that kind of know you and understand what you need. Um, and husband and wife combination Absolutely. Is, is imperative to that. Um, speaking of that, you know, you've been married for over 30 years. How much exactly? Almost 30 years now. So we've been, my, me and my wife have been together now 32 years. That's a long time. What's the secret to uh, selling your wife, I guess you could say? I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, what is this? I get this question all the time. You know, what is the secret to marriage? You know, how right. do you keep it going? And, you know, there's a bunch of things you do it because it's never one thing. There's no silver bullet. There's a lot of little things you do. Right. I think the biggest lesson I've learned is not to hold a grudge. Yes. Do you know, when we disagree, we're like, no, I disagree yeah. with you, Daniel. And then you walk away, I disagree with you, Victor. Yeah, we want to fight. No, and like, we, we, we come back later on and we're like, all right, where are we at? Yeah. And like, you know, and it, there's this there's this bending that has to happen on both sides. Exactly. Because there's a couple of times, I'll, I'll use our, our current house as an example. We looked at like, I don't know, 10 to 15 houses, something like that. Right. First one we looked at, my wife said, this is the house. I'm like, that's not the house. <laughs> right? So we looked at the other houses. And, and so I wanted a brand new house. This house was like five, 10 years old. My wife's like, no, 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 that's the house you want. Right. And I'm like, no, I don't want that house. So we had to go back and revisit the house a few times and we wound up buying that house. Right. And so I capitulated because I, I, you know, there was something about her conviction that right. says, I think I see something you don't. Right. To this day, I am glad she picked that house. Right. Because the other houses we looked at are in places now that are just nightmarish, right. you know, in terms of traffic. Of so she saw something in the house that I didn't see. And that's where the, you know, again, sometimes it's okay to let the other person have it their way. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and I think course. it's hard because from an egotistic standpoint, mm -hmm. you know, I want to be right. Yeah. And especially course. if you're a guy, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I want to be right. Of course. And yeah. it's okay to let the other person be right and, and do it their way. Right, Let's right. try it your way. And, and there's situations where, you know, people think that couples don't argue all. And, and the fact is that everyone can argue, right, as a couple. But the difference is that a successful couple is able to resolve the problem sooner. They don't hold the grudge for a whole week, like Victor is saying. No. They get over it in minutes. You know what? Let's talk. You know, let's try to work this out. What do you need? Okay, get me what I need. Let's work this thing out. Let's make a decision. Let's be happy. And I think that's really, um, yep. I think that's the potion, you know? I think, I think the biggest thing for us also is that when we're like disagreeing and it gets just a little heated, right. which is really rare for us. It really is. Really rare. It's really rare for us. We'll just like walk away like, all right, you know what? Get back to it. Back to our neutral corners. Yeah. That type of thing. And it'll come back when you're, we're in a cold state. Right. If you're in a hot state, you know, anything can fly out of your mouth. Right. Um, but... If, if I would 
something's come to mind right now. Right. If I were to say what is the key to marriage is that you have to detach your ego. Yes. That's it. I think that is the kernel yeah. of a successful marriage. Yeah. I just came up with that right yeah. now. And, and someone said, yeah. <laughs> someone once said um, ego oh. means edging God out. Right. Um, you're edging out a greater purpose because you're focused on yourself. You're trying to get what you need yep. and you're trying to push away their needs yep. because you can only think about yourself and only your needs. And yes. Guys, you have to focus on other people. You have to serve. You have to have that mentality that other people need exactly what you have. But even in the selling situation or in business, you have to be able to put yourself in the other person's shoes and know exactly how you can give them exactly what they want. Nice tie-in, by the way. That's a great tie-in. Thank, right thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, because you know. it is, because it is it is true, right? That sometimes you have to even even in the sales process, you have to be egoless. Right. I mean, my ego says I want to sell you the product because I want to make money. Right. But I have to detach my ego. Is can I really help you? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I think that's what we are not taught in selling. Right. Can I really help you? Does this product or service can it really help you? Yeah. And, and, and you were saying earlier that sales is not taught in school. No. Right. No. Even though it should be. You know, we we don't learn sales. Sales. We don't learn marketing. We don't learn leadership public speaking and actually we both know that public speaking perpetuates our success in absolutely. sales. Absolutely. You know? um, Victor actually has a successful YouTube channel uh, and has reached millions of people through it and how's public speaking helped you in your sales career? I joined Toastmasters way back when, won't give you the year, by the way if you search online <laughs> for Victor Antonio's first Toastmaster presentation, oh, yeah. it's actually on YouTube, uh, horrible. Horrible. Just look it up, uh, guys. But but you know it's funny because people see that they're motivated because yeah. they're like, wow, you really stunk. Yeah. You know, and I go, yeah, but I got better. And they're like, I, if you can, if you stunk that bad, maybe yeah. I, there's hope for me. Yeah. And so when I first started public speaking, I was in corporate America, and I realized that your ability to communicate will dictate your level of success. Exactly. No doubt about it. And every listen way. to me, no doubt about it. Your ability to communicate effectively, your ideas, your thoughts. Your, you know, whatever you want to try to persuade somebody yeah. on, ideas, goals, whatever it may be, yeah. is tied to how you can do that. Exactly. And Toastmasters showed me how to do that. Yeah. And so I always push public speaking. Again, something as you mentioned, right. is not taught in schools. Yeah. And also, guys, keep in mind that communication is not only interpersonal. It's not what you say to other people. It's what you say to yourself. It's what you say to others. It's what you say to the supernatural being, God or the universe, whatever you believe in. You communicate all the time. And we were talking about affirmations a little bit earlier too. Because a lot of times, let's go back to sales. If someone is going door to door sales or they're selling cars and you know they're going through the process and they feel a little doubt in themselves or maybe they face rejection or they're having a hard time, what do you think about affirmations and you know talking to yourself? Do you use affirmations? I personally don't use affirmations, but I'm going to tie this back to a pseudo affirmation, if right. I may. <laughs> so many years ago, I read a book by Dr. Martin Seligman, University of Pennsylvania. It's a book called Learned Optimism. Right. And what, what he taught me was, by the way, he was the founder of positive psychology. Yeah. And to give you a long, to make a long story short, here's what he found out in these experiments: is that it's how what we say to ourselves. Right that determines our success, yes. whether we're optimist or pessimist. He said the, opt the optimist, when something bad, rejection in right. sales, happens to an optimist, he's like, hmm, that didn't go well. Yeah. Okay, how can I do that better? Because that, you know, that just wasn't me. Right. I should have said this, well, the yeah. next one, I'll get the next one. Exactly. You know, I'll just polish that up a little bit, say it this way, say it that way, and I'll bet you it'll work next time. Right. That's the optimist. The pessimist will go, you know what, I knew it. I'm horrible at selling. Right. I right. can't do this. You know, nobody in my family has ever been in sales. I knew this was a horrible job. What did I do? And yeah. that's that self-talk. Right. So I believe in affirmation is to me, let's go back to awareness, almost yeah. like mindfulness. You have to watch what you say to yourself. Right, right. Isn't that weird to say that? You, you have gotta to watch what you say to yourself. Yeah. Because what you say to yourself is really how you really think. Right. And how you feel too. Yes. Right? Because thoughts lead to feelings, which leads to actions, yes. which leads to results. And I always believe that what you say to yourself is what others will say about you too. You know, if you think you're ugly, other people are going to think you're ugly because you're going to treat yourself like you're ugly. Right. But if you think you're strong and you're good looking, then you're going to treat yourself like a king or a queen. And you're going to step into that favor, right? You're going to step into that person that you really want to be. So, Victor, um, sales is the highest paying profession. Nothing moves without a sale. Mm -hmm. What is the number one tip? The number one tip you believe that salespeople need to know to be very successful, to make that million dollar mark? Prospecting. Prospecting. That's it. Tell you know what? what? If you don't have people coming into your pipeline, right. right, into your funnel, then you're not selling. Yeah. So I think, you know, I was with Grant Cardone, as you know, so we did a three-day boot camp, right? right? And Grant said something. I don't know if it's his phrase. I don't think it's his phrase, but he said it, and when he said it, 
it really resonated. Maybe it's just the word he used. Right. He goes, if you're worried about sales, your pipeline is broken. Right, right. And I was like, huh, that's yeah. kind of concise. Yeah. I really like that, right? Yeah, if you're, it's if you're worried about sales, your pipeline is broken. Yeah. The implication there is that if your pipeline is broken, means you're not doing something on the front end. Because yeah. if I had 100 people waiting at the door to talk to me, I'm not worried about rejection. Of course. Because I'm going next. Yeah. But if I only have one or two people waiting at the door for me. That's a problem. That's a problem. That's a big problem. And so prospecting is the biggest skill set that most salespeople fail at. Right. There was a study, I think it was done by CSO Insight, that says, and I think this year's number is going to be even lower, but on average, 51% of salespeople don't hit their number. <laughs> 51, that means half, That's don't tough. hit the number. And the numbers have been going down. Yeah. yeah for the last maybe three to five years. Right, right. So less and less people are hitting their number. And again, part of it is they don't know how to prospect. And prospecting has changed, as you know. Being an internet superstar with your video that's over, what is it, six million views? Yeah. So you know that being my, out my, there, my TED Talk, by the way. His TED Talk, if you haven't seen it, check it out. It's an amazing talk, and again, congratulations. Thank you. And, and so you know that it is about prospecting, right? But you know that it's not only about the phone. Right. You know it's about social media. Exactly. You know it's about leaving those voicemails. Yeah. You know it's about sending that email, that text. You know it's about that whole combination of yeah. how do we get prospects into the pipeline. Exactly. Most people are still stuck in either the phone or social media. Right. And I believe there's a blending of mixed medias that has to happen. Exactly. And guys, remember, the fortune is in the follow-up. Yes. You know, sometimes somebody might reject you in March. Call them up in, in August and see how they feel. Things change, circumstances change, mm -hmm. people change. And sometimes you might think they were rejecting you, but maybe it was your product or service, you know, or vice versa, right? So always consider other people's perspectives and also understand that we're always changing, right? People are always changing their minds, they're changing their hearts, and they change the way they feel about everything. Um, I like what, you, like what you said, if I could just add on to the follow up, because it's not only if they said no and you have to follow up, yes, we have to do that. Yes. But let me do the and on that one. And. If somebody already bought from you, yeah. let's go back and upsell them or cross sell them something else. They're gonna buy again. Right. Right. All right. the time. And then how about and again, referrals. Why don't we go back to those people who bought from yeah. us? Or even if they didn't buy or from us. Or testimonies. Yes, testimonies. Yeah. Anything to say, hey, who else might be interested? Yeah. Or if I use testimonials, how can I use that for marketing purposes? Mm -hmm. But in the follow-up, it's very fascinating. One study showed that 84% of clients are willing to give you referrals. Right but less than 23% actually give it because most people don't ask for it. <laughs> yeah, you and all, all you gotta do is ask. Yeah, the fortune's in the follow-up. Yeah, ask. Yeah. Um, you know, like for instance, let's say you sold a book. Ask somebody, they might even say, I loved your book. All right, would you mind leaving me a five-star review? It's something so easy, right? There you go. Um, now we're talking about selling in the entrepreneur space too, mm -hmm. but before you sell in that way, what's preceded by it is marketing. Yes. Right, and marketing is getting yourself out there and sales is getting people to buy your message yourself, right. right? How do you go about marketing? Because your YouTube channel is pretty successful and it's growing, guys. It's growing really fast. I think, you know, that's it's, it's a good question because, you know, you know, we could probably do a marketing event together <laughs> and we'll have two totally different strategies, right? Yeah. And both will be right, right for what we do. Yeah. The, the first thing I discovered for me, Daniel, was that I had to focus on a niche. Yes. And my niche is sales. If I had to add a second word, it's sales and motivation, but mostly sales, right? Why, how to sell. And then I always like to look at the influence piece, why people buy, why do they make these decisions, right? right? And so the first part of my branding was, I'm all about sales. Yeah. Because I believe that people only have one category for you in their head. They wanna know what you are. Yeah. So how can you help me? Right. And so when people look at me, they go, that's the sales guy. Right. Right. When they look at you, they might go, that's the, what's your blank? That's the blank guy. What will right. your blank be? Just wealth building mindset. He's the wealth, or let's say he's the mindset guy. He's right. the wealth building guy. Yeah. And then that to me is the branding that you have to pound into the market exactly. all the time. But if today I'm saying, well, I'm a sales trainer today. Tomorrow I'm an internet marketer. Exactly. Tomorrow I'm a customer service rep. Tomorrow I'll help you team build. Yeah. You know, tomorrow I'll help you with leadership. And you know what? If you need your dog walk, I will do that too. Yeah. They're confused. You've confused the market in terms of who you are. Yeah. So I think by focusing in on one thing right, right. and then going deep into that niche, because I truly believe that once you start studying something, right. in my case sales, you begin to see things that most people don't see. Of course. Because you become, you, I don't know, I don't want to say you reach that level of awareness again. Well, you, you have. really have, yeah. You, you have. have. And then yeah. you probably see it, right? When you study mindset, maybe initially you read what everybody else read. Right. And then you went a little deeper and said, well, maybe let me look at it from this angle. So maybe you started reading yeah. different types hey, of books. We're, we're talking about perspective too. Yes. Yeah, yes. your perspective changes and then you're able to sell that perspective 
to the people who are your prospects, your leads. So how important is that? To shift their perspective is very important. Yeah. Because again, you know, most buyers today, look look up, see if this makes sense to you. You, ever, you go on Amazon, right? You have this idea of what you want to buy, yeah. right? So let's walk through the process. You go on Amazon, you go click. That's what I want to look at. Type it into the search, category, electronics. I'm looking for a certain camera, right? Yeah. Boom, you click that in. Then what do you immediately do? You got the description, look at the price, yeah. and then what do you do? Make a decision. No, you go to the reviews. Typically you go to the oh, reviews, yeah. right? Well, you yeah. go to reviews. You gotta, so, yeah, okay. you gotta do the research. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta do the research. You're in research mode still. You're in research, not buying, you, you haven't analyzed it. You, yeah. So you go to the reviews, and how do you look at the reviews? You gotta like really know what you want. Like right. You gotta see what the best people are saying, and right. also what the worst people are saying. Boom, you go, right. you go to the five star, you go to the one star, yeah. then you kind of settle in somewhere three or four, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, what does Amazon do? At the bottom it says, People who bought that also bought what? This. That, yeah. right? Cross and, yeah. So all of a sudden you go, what's that? Yeah. And then you go there, you click, and next thing you know, you're off on this hyperlinking ex episode, yeah. and then you wind up buying a different type of camera right, right. because you informed yourself through the buying process, right? Yeah. And so think about selling today one-on-one. -on -one. It's right. almost the same thing. The customer doesn't know. They've seen so much information. Yeah. Google did a study that says on average, you will look at 10 sources of information before deciding to contact a company. Yeah. So you think, well, okay, maybe they know what they want, but they don't. They're more confused than ever. Right. So that's where we as salespeople come into play. Right. You're so confused. Here, let me help you. you make out. it easy. Let me, let me help you see the force from the trees, yeah. as yeah. you said earlier, right? Yeah. yeah. Do it that way. So that's how selling has changed. And the ability of a great salesperson to remove the clutter yeah. so you can make a quick decision is what selling is about. Yeah. And you know, really, the confused mind says no. I mean, you think about it, you walk into a candy shop and all this candy is in front of your face. But if someone comes up to you and says, would you like to try one of these three options? Then you know what you want. You're going to actually try something and you say, oh, well, that was good. Where can I get more of that? Then you're going right. to buy a box. You might buy a case. You might buy the whole store, right? So the, the salesperson makes the decision easier for the client. And guys, remember, people buy emotionally but justify logically. Right, they buy based on how they feel, right? And then they make a decision later and they say, oh yeah, I made the right decision. Absolutely. I know exactly why. And then they enumerate the reasons. Isn't that true? That's absolutely right. You know, a lot of it is based on an emotional level. You know, the, uh, how, it's funny because when you look at making a buy decision, it's like you swear it's all logical. Right. But at a certain level, and again, there are products that you have to be logical about. Exactly. If I'm buying a large network server <laughs> that's going to serve all the United States and I got, you know, it's a very complex sale, right. yeah, you might want to argue that's more logical. But on a transactional sale, yeah. like a B2C sale, yeah. it's always more emotional than ever, right? Exactly. When you buy a car, when you buy a phone, when you buy clothes, it's all emotional first, then you rationalize it later, so you're, you're dead on. Yeah. Victor, it's been such a good time. We can talk for years if yes, you wanted we to. And uh, we might even do a second interview. Guys, leave some comments below. Um, we talked about a lot of things, and we're going to clarify. I have the link in the description for his book, Sales Ex Machina. And also, uh, his channel will be linked up too. So guys, please subscribe to his channel. And Victor, any last words for those who are getting into sales or even mastering sales? Well, I think you and I are a perfect combination. Here's why. Yeah. I got the sales piece, yeah. but you got the mindset piece, right? <laughs> yeah. And I think without mindset, it doesn't good. I, I provide the skill set. Right. You provide the mindset. Without the mindset, the skill set doesn't work. Exactly. I can study all I want, right. but if I don't have the right mindset, which is what you offer, right then this will never work. Exactly. I need you. Yeah. How's and that? I need you. I need you. <laughs> and, and really, you focus on general skills, which eventually becomes specific skills, right? right? You focus on the basics, like time management, goal setting, right? Managing your money. And then you become specific, branding, sales, marketing. And then you get really, really finite. You know, you start <laughs> doing networking things and you start learning how to dress. And that's really what it's all about. That's what success is about. Guys, it's been a really good time. And again, thank you, Victor. I appreciate you so much. Much thank love you so to you, much. brother. Thank you very much. Man. All right. Appreciate Take it. Care. Take care, guys. All right.